Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for a look at Elizabethan England. Uh, with the recent death of Queen Elizabeth II, a second Elizabethan age of uh, English history has come to an end. So today we're going to look at, into the past and recall the first Queen Elizabeth, who reigned from 1558 to 1603. And we will examine the art created during her reign as the queen and her uh, quarters um, express their dominance through their portraits and palaces, decorative arts, and stately homes. And so this program is led by art historian Mary Woodward, who serves as a guide at several historic New England properties. She previously served as public programs coordinator and educator at the Concord Museum. She has a BA in his art history from Furman University and an MA in art history from Emory University. She has more than 40 years of experience in museums of all shapes and sizes, from the comprehensive collection at the Cleveland Museum of Art to the one room log cabin birthplace of President James K. Polk. And again, we thank, well, we thank the Tewksbury Cultural Council and the Friends of the Tewksbury Library, as well as our partners in North Reading and Ashland. So all 150 of us, <laughs> let's give a big virtual round of applause to Mary for joining us this morning. And Mary, you can take it away. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you, thank you so much, Robert. Thank you uh, to Robert and the Friends of the Tewksbury Library. And thank all of you who are joining us um, in this international morning together. Uh, power, politics, and portraits. We're looking at Elizabethan England. So as Robert said, today we're going to turn our attention to the first Elizabethan age, the 44 year long reign of the first Queen Elizabeth. It's rightly been called England's golden age. We'll focus on images of Elizabeth and her courtiers because portraits were really used in a different way than we think of today. Rather than recording an exact likeness, they were expressions of power and prestige and a way of announcing one's allegiance in a very political time. Elizabeth and her older half-sister Mary I, who ruled for five years before her, were both daughters of King Henry VIII. They were the first two female monarchs in England's history, and as such, one author says, they had to improvise their iconography. Elizabeth often referred to herself as a prince, but she used her femininity when she needed to. She always put her country's needs before her own, as she said, like a mother. She created a court based upon the principles of chivalry and courtly love. The courtiers spun around her like planets to the sun, seeking her grace and favor. Elizabeth was born for power, in spite of some serious early setbacks, and she worked hard to keep it. She ruled by reason and sometimes whimsy, at times decisive, at other times indecisive. Her father's marriages had served as a lesson to her about matrimony. Instead, she chose to, uh, her, uh, to establish her own identity and control as much power herself. While those near her expressed their favored status through portraits and palaces to impress her. Anne Boleyn had promised Henry a son, yet their first child was a disappointing daughter, Elizabeth, and the king was unhappy. They were so sure they were having a son that they'd already printed up birth announcements, which said Prince. An S had to be quickly added to them so they would read Princess. Henry grew suspicious of Anne as the years passed and they had no son. He had the marriage annulled. She was found guilty on a number of various charges and beheaded. Elizabeth was a toddler when she was sent away from, to the, live in the country away from her father and away from court because she was now considered illegitimate by everyone, including her father. The artist Hans Holbein, who did this magnificent portrait of Henry VIII here, was a German artist who had moved to London and became the court painter for Henry VIII. Holbein is renowned for his realistic and insightful portraits of Henry and his court. 
but we'll see how Elizabeth's portraits change. They begin quite realistically in this mode and then develop into uh, more of a messaging system uh, via pattern and pose. The first time we see Elizabeth in a large portrait is here as a young teenage girl. She, Elizabeth commissioned this portrait as a Christmas gift for her father, Henry VIII, to show herself as a virtuous scholarly princess. While spending years away from her father and his court, she was schooled in more than the usual for girls, which was music and needlepoint. She also learned writing, logic, rhetoric, philosophy, even numbers, accounting. And she had an affinity for languages. She spoke Latin, Greek, French, Spanish, Italian, and a little Welsh. But here we see the message she's trying to send very clearly uh, to her father through her choice of clothing. Her sleeves, the goldeny and silvery parts coming out from the red there are made of cloth of silver, which is a cloth woven of silk threads that are actually wrapped with silver or even gilded silver or gold around the thread. And they also feature a gold embroidered pomegranate pattern. Only the king and his closest relatives could wear this kind of fabric by law. So she's reiterating her place in the line of succession. Um, today, instead of cloth of gold, uh, you may be familiar with lame, which are those threads that are covered with, you know, fake gold, similar. Henry's male heir, the young Hen Edward VI, ruled right after his father's death, and he ruled from age nine to 15 before dying himself. And there we see him in a charming Hans Holbein portrait. Then Mary I, Henry's daughter with Catherine of Aragon and his eldest child also ruled for just five years before, um, after Edward died, and she herself died childless. So Elizabeth is crowned queen in 1558 at the age of 25, and she rules until she's 69. So let's look at this known as the coronation portrait. It was copied from a, an original by the artist Willem Scrotz. He was a Flemish artist who had followed Hans Holbein in as court painter, um, but we're losing the realism of Hans Holbein, aren't we? Scrotz was more of a mannerist painter. He was more interested in symbol, in shape, in two-dimensional patterning. And so here we see her at the start of her queenship. She's being portrayed in this icon-like fashion. And this process continues through her long reign. Orb, scepter, crown, and dress. It's hard to see an actual person in there, much less the body of a young woman. This was the start of Elizabeth's official portraits as Queen of England, meant to portray her as completely capable of the job, regardless of her sex. Her new portrait was meant to show everyone that she was indeed the natural heir to her father, Henry VIII, and that she was competent to do the job. The vast majority of Elizabeth's new subjects believed that women were naturally inferior to men in every respect. They apparently had neither the intelligence nor the strength of character to make their own way in the world. Well, she saw herself as the exception to that. She declared early on, I will have but one mistress here and no master, explaining her decision to never marry. Now, among the men lining up to try to change her mind and marry Elizabeth was Ivan the Terrible, the Tsar of Russia. He sent her hundreds of ermine pelts, which were long associated with royalty, and perhaps it was some of those that were used to line this beautiful cloak that she's wearing here. So even though Elizabeth's on the throne, not everyone was thrilled to have another queen um, right after Queen Mary. She was kind of disastrous. And so now we've got another queen, Elizabeth. In early 1558, 
John Knox, the Scottish religious reformer, had published his treatise called The First Blast of the Trumpet Against the Monstrous Regiment of Women. And he gave his reasons why women shouldn't be leaders. Uh, A, it was repugnant to nature. B, it was against God's wishes. Um, and C, it was the subversion of good order and all equity and justice. Well, after Elizabeth became queen later that year, Knox tried to apologize, saying he meant only Catholic women like her sister Mary the first, her half sister Mary the first, shouldn't be rulers. Um, but she banned him for life from England anyway. So let's take a look at some of the, take an opportunity now to talk about clothing in Elizabethan era, and in particular, because it was so central to Elizabeth's portraits. This portrait, by the way, is one that experts are sure that she sat for in person. It's not a copy. Um, she must have been pleased with the way the face looks here because it was used as a model for later other portraits for many years. In this um, portrait called the Darnley portrait, she's about 42 years old. Uh, there was an inventory taken of her clothing before her death, and they counted between 2,000 and 3,000 pieces of clothing. And naturally, it took a large staff working in the Queen's wardrobe, uh, the room for her clothes, to, to deal with all of that, to manage it. Um, so let's go through what that clothing consisted of. If you were trying to get dressed in the morning and you were someone, um, say, Elizabeth, you'd start with a smock, and then a petticoat, a bodice, a skirt, a farthingale, which was that framework under the skirt, which could stick out a few feet to either side, and we'll see some, um, some images of that later. Then there'd be a kirtle, which was a long gown underneath the gown, and then the gown on top, then the sleeves, and then you'd have to accessorize with things like collars and ruffs and stomachers and cuffs and gloves and shoes. And then there were the wigs and the jewels and the makeup. All told, it would probably take about two hours for her to be dressed. Pieces of clothing were interchangeable because they were held together by laces or pins. So you could make on almost endless variety of outfits. One author says fashionable Elizabethan women um, was like a walking, walking pin cushion. She was liable to come unstuck, showering pins at any movement. And another reports that the Queen's wardrobe staff had ordered these pins by the thousands. Um, there's an order in 1565 for 19,000 small head pins uh, that they thought would they would cover about six months worth of use. The pins weren't cheap, and this gave rise to the special allowance given to married women by their husbands called pin money. Here's an example in the photo from uh, Instagram of London Mudlark, who's uh, one of those mudlockers who looks for things in the foreshore at the Thames, and that's a rather large example of a um, 16th or 17th century pin that they had recently found. So Elizabeth's clothing was crucially important to her and to the crafting and creation of this image of her as this solitary ruler. But it seems her clothing seems to have been rather um, not well thought of afterwards, not well cared for, recycled, reused after her death. Some of it ended up as being used as costumes in her, her uh, successor's court. Um, surprisingly, historians knew of no articles of clothing belonging to Elizabeth still surviving until one happy discovery. In 2016, this piece of embroidered cloth was identified as almost certainly being part of a dress belonging to Elizabeth I. It had spent centuries quietly in a church in Bacton, England, first serving as the altar cloth, which is why it's shaped the way it is right there, and then framed and hung on display. Bacton was the home church of a woman named Blanche Perry, who had served the queen as her chief gentlewoman from the time Elizabeth was an infant until Blanche's own death at the 57 years later. Blanche never married. She was devoted to Elizabeth, and Elizabeth was apparently devoted to her. It's thought that this dress fabric was given to the church in memory of Blanche by Elizabeth. 
in addition to the silver and gold threads, and it's badly <laughs> damaged, even though it's been restored, um, there with the red threads have been dyed with cochineal from Mexico and the blue from with indigo from India. So this was a high status piece and it bears a very strong resemblance to a dress that Elizabeth wears uh, in a portrait we'll see later on. So look at just the foliate or leaf or stem flat, um, plant images and compare it to the one on the right and think away the frogs and the butterflies and the little um, animals and insects you see because those were added later. Uh, to the fabric. So this is women's clothing. Men's clothing in Elizabeth's court very, was very important as well. So let's turn our attention to some of the men in Elizabeth's life, starting um, with her most favorite, probably true love, Robert Dudley. He was a nobleman. They'd been friends since childhood. He married someone else quite young, and then sadly and mysteriously, his wife died in a fall down some steps while everyone was away from home, their home. Um, he wasn't charged in her death, but it was ruled an act, and it was ruled an accident, but the court of public opinion didn't agree. And it made it impossible, certainly, uh, even if Elizabeth, if he had talked her into marrying, it made it impossible for her to marry Dudley. But they remained very close the rest of his life, um, very, very close. She installed him in an apartment next to hers for years. She gave him special honors and titles and lands. And one of the things she gave him was Kenilworth Castle, this magnificent house the uh, red brick gatehouse you see there in the corner, that's just the gatehouse. Uh, and it was there in 1575 that Dudley, who was known as the Earl of Leicester, among other titles she gave him, he hosted an 18 day party on her behalf, full of feasts and pageants and hunting and dancing, all her favorite things. Dudley really set the standard for entertaining the queen and for royal gift giving. There would be one gift upon, to her upon her arrival and then another gift on her departure. He was the epitome of the dashing royal champion. Uh, and even though he's not wearing it here, he was in fact her knight in shining armor. But let's look closely at what he is wearing because it was important for him as well to look every bit the part. The clothes make the man, right? Well, Mark Twain said that, but it could just as easily have been Elizabeth's contemporary William Shakespeare, right? This pointed chess piece in front of that he's wearing in front of him is the peas cod. It's a padded shaped front garment, and it's seen both in clothing that you see there, and because it was so darn fashionable, it got cover, it got recreated in armor as well. So let's look at Sir Anthony over there on the on the right uh, left rather, uh, Sir Anthony, like a pea in a pea pod shape. The peas cod was uh, stuffed inside with light filling called bombast. It would weigh four to six pounds, and um, the legs were left to show. It was cut up high. The legs were left to show because you know the more athletic and shapely, the better. Sir Anthony is seen here uh, within a jousting tent. So he's either in the process of putting on his armor or taking off his armor. But look at the, and that includes his, he's already wearing the peas cod shaped breastplate. Look how dapper and confident he is, such swagger. Uh, soon the word bombast was used figuratively to describe the kind of fluffy, pretentious words that someone like Sir Anthony would be saying to the Queen. Uh, and then it wasn't too far to become an adjective bombastic. Um, but it's probably the cod piece, let's just say it, that is the most famous or infamous element of men's clothing during this time. And who better to demonstrate that than Elizabeth's father? The, and here he is in a larger full-scale portrait by Hans Holbein. I've just edited it, but in the real portrait, all of him is on display. The cob piece started as a necessary piece of fabric where the legs of pants would join and then hmm, became outsized and padded. Naturally, it was meant to suggest a certain power and majesty. 
But it was also really a useful article of clothing, according to historian Lucy Worsley. And if you watch her, she's she's a stitch. Uh, it was roomy enough, she said, for men to keep the surprising things in there, coins, um, keys, even jewels. And she says this leads to the expression, a man's crown jewels. Now, Parliament and Elizabeth's court counselors continued to try to find Elizabeth a suitable husband uh, until she was almost in her 50s. But she had already decided on a radically different path for herself. Marriage would mean sharing power, and she was not inclined to do that. The Pelican portrait here by the artist Nicholas Hilliard, and we'll see more works by Hilliard. He was famous for being a miniaturist, making these beautiful, sometimes watercolor on vellum, teeny little pocket portraits that you literally would carry in a pocket or as a brooch or something. But he also painted full scale works and they're magnificent. This is called the Pelican portrait. In the 1570s, in her 40s, the iconography begins to tell the message that she will never marry and produce an heir, but is instead married to the state. She is the virgin queen. Looking beyond the pearls and the jewels of her outfit here for a moment, there is the pelican. It's the symbol of Christian iconography from Christian iconography. The pelican was said to pluck its breast to feed its young with its own blood. And that's emblematic of her own self-sacrifice for her subjects. Now, we're going to focus on the next one. Looking at her sleeves, they are depicted as being made in a particularly fashionable cloth at the time called black work embroidery. It's a very fine linen with silk and gilded silver wrapped threads. And there's the Tudor rose. You see it in this example that belongs to the Met at the bottom, but you can also see it in the um, cutout uh, detail of her sleeve. The Tudor Rose, an emblem created for her grandfather, Henry VII's reign, to mark the start of their family dynasty. The next portrait we're going to look at comes a few years later, and it's called the Civ Portrait. The title refers to an ancient legend about a Vestal Virgin who could carry water in a sieve, and you see Elizabeth holding a sieve in her hand, and have none of it drop out. The, and so that's an allusion to Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen. And here was a celebration of her virginity, but specifically it's her ability and determination to rule Elizabeth, uh, England alone. She was wedded to England alone. She's 50 years old here. Parliament and her courtiers who are seen behind her, some of them literally waiting in the wings, um, should finally be getting the message now. She's not marrying and producing an heir. She felt she was all the monarch England needed. And I think she was right. <laughs> um, so let's look at the next one. It's known as the Ditchley portrait because of where it was created. As, a, as it was common for her courtiers, um, Sir Henry Lee, the Queen's Master of Armories and Champion of the Tilt, commissioned this portrait as a gift on the occasion of Elizabeth's visit to his country home in September of 1592. It's an image of supreme power. She's commanding her people, her country, even nature, as it would seem, because she's got the dark stormy bit behind her and in front of her blue skies. She is all style and silhouette here, isn't she? There's the farthingale that you see holding her skirt out so broadly to either side. When she visited, Henry staged outdoor entertainments, um, including plays, tilts in the tilt yard with armors, of course, horseback, and tableau, beautiful um, dramatic presentations. He also had a banqueting house in the woods built with a turf and flower roof. The inscription on the painting, and there are a number of them, there's a sonnet, there are a couple of inscriptions around on the sides of the paintings, but one of them suggests that maybe Sir Henry had done something he needed to ask forgiveness for because it says she can, but does not take revenge. Her feet are firmly planted in England, and they're actually firmly planted on his piece of property, as you can see the detail there on the map. Um, 
by the way, she says she wasn't very much a fan. I mean, it said that she wasn't a fan of the way her face was portrayed here. Probably a bit too realistic. She's about 59 right here. So in later versions of this painting, she's younger. And now we're used to thinking of painted portraits as unique single works of art, but they were often in Elizabeth's and time, and even in her father time, Henry VIII, there were a number of copies or versions of these portraits made, commissioned either by other courtiers or by her government to spread her likeness around the realm. Uh, and she was a well-traveled monarch, going on 25 summer progresses, but only staking to the counties that were closest to London. And the purpose, of course, was to be seen by her subjects. Sometimes she would stay at her own properties. Other times she would stay at her courtiers' homes. Now, if you were expecting the queen to visit, the first people to arrive would be the harbingers, the people responsible for seeing if the accommodations were up to snuff. Some of these trips went on for months, and she didn't travel lightly. One source says it would take about 300 wagons and maybe 2,000 horses to move the queen's household. And I'm not going to say that she was picky, but if the local ale wasn't up to her liking, a London brewer would accompany the entourage and set up a local brewery. Uh, now, harbinger is a word that we still use to say someone's saying something or something is announcing what's going to happen. And that is how the word was used then. But it is actually from the Anglo-French roots that mean uh, herbers, which meant lodgings. So in Elizabeth's time, it was particularly people who were going out to look for her lodgings and to see if they would be appropriate. Um, would she find an appropriate spot at these places? Probably. Especially during Elizabeth's reign, many wealthy nobles who peopled her court and dressed to the nines to impress also built massive, elaborate homes known as prodigy houses as a way of announcing their status. They'd arrived socially and politically, and they meant for their queen and their peers and everyone else to be impressed. One author states, frankly, never before and never since has there been an era in England of such stupendous domestic architecture. And here are two really beautiful ones, Longleat House on the left, still lived in by the original family, and Wollaton Hall, which is now a museum in Nottingham. Both of these homes are associated with the person named Robert Smithson. We would today call him an architect. They didn't have that term then. So he's listed sometimes as surveyor and master mason. Um, but you can see how magnificent these are. Many of these homes were built or have expanded in the anticipation of a royal visit. Gardens were created, Dudley did that at Kenilworth, rivers diverted, unsightly villages moved out of the way, and state rooms with thrones were at the ready, all in the possibility that the queen would come your way. Having a portrait of the queen on view at your home in case she stopped in was a good investment. The closer association one had with Elizabeth, the better life would be. One of those who spent years serving Elizabeth and seeking her approval was another woman named Elizabeth, Countess of Shrewsbury, the second richest woman in the country. She was known as best by most people, and you see her here in a portrait by Hans Eworth, who was also a follower of uh, Hans Holbein. Here she is at about the age 40. One author says it's not so much a record of beauty as it is a portrait of wealth and status. Here is a woman of consequence. She's chosen her clothing wisely. She was a friend of Elizabeth's. She was, as I said, another fiery redhead, a powerful woman. She was often at court, even though her home was in Derbyshire, which was further north than Elizabeth ever traveled. Um, and she was at court, she was known as Bess of Hardwick for the most part. At the time that this portrait was painted, she was newly married for the third time. She outlived four husbands in total, becoming wealthier each time. 
As I said, she chose her clothes wisely for the portrait. She's wearing a high status black velvet gown, extremely expensive black velvet was, uh, with red embroidery on the sleeves. She has pearls at her neck, hard to see perhaps, and pearls in her headpiece. She loved pearls almost as much as Elizabeth did. Now, when her fourth husband and last one, the Earl of Shrewsbury died, Bess began building a new home, but she was building it adjacent to the home she had grown up in uh, and was already in the process of renovating. So in this aerial view, which is uh, tied to the fence there, you can see the older one on the left, kind of a rambling thing from a medieval core, but, uh, but Bess was in the process of, of, of building new on it. Uh, but then after the fourth husband died, uh, she embarked on building her new home. And the new home is the one in the aerial view to the right. And let's see, there'd be absolutely no denying whose house this was. There across the top, the roof parapet are her initials, ES for Elizabeth Shrewsbury, Shrewsbury being her fourth husband's um, title. About four feet tall, those things stand across the roof line. Hardwick Hall, more glass than wall, the saying goes. According to renowned architectural historian Marc Giraud, Hardwick was the absolute pinnacle of a unique movement in Elizabethan architecture. Bess spared no expense. This prodigy house, like the others, was different from earlier castles in that in addition to being symmetrical, as you see, beautifully planned out, uh, they could have huge windows because it was peacetime. And so this wasn't a castle, didn't need to be defended. The important ceremonial rooms were moved upstairs to the upper floors so they could take in even more light. And then the scale, oh my Lord, um, I left the person in the picture down there at the bottom in the red jacket so you could get a sense. Uh, it just gets bigger and bigger as it gets taller, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, the rooms were, the houses were huge. One of the developments that took hold and blossomed during Elizabeth's time was the creation of the Long Gallery, which provided a place to walk inside in inclement weather while admiring the tapestries and the portraits and, of course, engaging in some good gossip. Now, at the red arrow on the left, you'll see a later portrait of Bess, and those are long ropes of pearls that she's wearing around her neck as you start down and make your progress down the long gallery. Bess was known for having a good head for finance and for getting a bargain when she wanted. She bought a set of tapestries off of another courtier who'd gone broke, but even then she managed to bargain a lower price because she had to have his coat of arms covered with her own. Tapestries were, in fact, the most important, uh, a most expensive, rather, form of art at the time because of the hours of labor it took to create them. And at Hardwick, um, we have one of the largest collections of tapestries in any private home in Europe. And there where the black arrow is at the end of about 160 or so odd feet of corridor or gallery is the portrait that Bess commissioned of her friend, Queen Elizabeth. This is the Hardwick portrait, also attributed to the workshop of Nicholas Hilliard. This image is more power pattern than personality, isn't it? And Elizabeth was preferring this as she continued to carefully manage her representation in the fourth decade of her reign. Nicholas Hilliard, the artist, as I said earlier, was famous for his miniatures, but this full-size uh, work has all the delicacy and detail of a miniature. Bess of Hardwick was an excellent needlewoman, and she often made the gifts that she gave Elizabeth, so it's not surprising that there are many pieces of needlework featured in this painting, like the cushions, the gloves, um, but also the skirt. Look at that beautiful fabric on the skirt. It's a fanciful jumble of flowers, which we would expect, and then some crazy sea creatures. It's fabulous. Now, for most of Elizabeth's, uh, for almost the entirety of Elizabeth's reign, rather, she had to deal with the ramifications of her father's change of religion for England from Catholic to Protestant. 
The Catholics in England and Europe still considered Elizabeth a, a usurper, a bastard, and not the rightful Queen of England. In fact, even the Pope told people that if anyone were to remove Elizabeth um, and commit a sin doing that, their sin would be forgiven. And the biggest challenge came uh, from a cousin with a very good claim to the throne, and that's Mary, Queen of Scots, that you see there. Now, our time together doesn't allow for a lengthy talk about these two, so I'll try to get it in, in bullet points for you as we look at that portrait. Mary um, tried to get Elizabeth to name her as her heir. That seemed reasonable, but Mary was Catholic and Elizabeth was not inclined to do that. Elizabeth um, never agreed to meet her in person. Mary left uh, Scotland and sought protection at her cousin's court in England, which proved to be a disastrous choice because Elizabeth and her counselors were quite suspicious of Mary, Queen of Scots. And so Elizabeth put her under house arrest for 19 years. Eventually, Mary was caught and incriminated in a plot against Elizabeth. Elizabeth was said that she didn't want to execute. She didn't want to issue an execution order for a woman she called her sister queen. Um, she just preferred it would happen uh, privately, like could, maybe someone would poison her. Uh, but her closest advisors insisted that she make a public thing of it, sign a death warrant. And so um, just over 400 and some odd years ago, just last week we could have celebrated, um, February 8th, 1587, Mary, Queen of Scots, was beheaded in two strokes. Mm. Uh, but in this portrait, she's been um, a prisoner, if you will, under house arrest for nearly 10 years. She's chosen the way to have herself depict here rather um, carefully because she's holding in her hand her rosary. So this is her Catholicism clearly on display. And her rosary bears the motto, trouble on all sides. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, she was. Um, she's looking pretty defiant, sort of haughty, a bit, a bit confident that her supporters are going to help her win the throne, but that did not happen, as we know. Mary's death, though, wasn't the end of the religious conflict, and it led to military action, which came to a head the following year. One of the most important battles in English history occurred during Elizabeth's reign, and we have a victorious portrait to mark the moment. It's 1588, and the Spanish Armada, a fleet of ships, have come towards England to invade and depose Queen Elizabeth. The smaller, vastly outnumbered English ships were streamlined with better sails. They had better firepower. You can see the English ships on this map coming in from the left, and the Spanish ships in their um, very typical crescent array there. This is a battle taking place off of uh, the Isle of Wight in the, um, in the English Channel. Now on land, uh, Elizabeth and the country and the soldiers were ner waited nervously to find out what was happening out at sea. Um, and I know I'm not alone in wishing that there existed a portrait of Elizabeth in the moment that she chose to go and speak to her soldiers. She wore armor over her bodice and gave an inspiring speech that was written down and printed at the time, right after she said it, uh, indicating that everyone knew that it was a pivotal moment, not just in her reign, but in England's history. And she said, I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king and of a king of England too. Well, between the England's naval tactics and storms, the Spanish cut their anchors and drifted away rather harmlessly what was left of the Spanish Armada. Uh, they actually ended up uh, drifting uh, and sailing, limping along all the way around the coast of England and Scotland and finally making its way a long and losing voyage back to Spain. So here is the victorious queen. Uh, this is one of three versions of what's known as the Armada portrait. Uh, this one's been cut down in, in, um, on at least three sides, so we're missing a few bits of it. But you can see over her shoulder there on the left side uh, in the lighter panel, the ships at sea. And on the left, what's dark um, is really the defeat of the Spanish um, fleet. And, Lucy Worsley said this dress was covered in about 800 pearls, which supposedly had to be removed each time the dress was washed. 
And um, perhaps more um, poignantly, those long strands of pearls that she's wearing are said to have been part of a, a group of pearls that she purchased from Queen Mar uh, Mary, Queen of Scots estate after she had died. Uh, some say that she wore them in honor of her cousin who had died, um, feeling regret that it had come to that. So we're going to end our look at Elizabeth and her uh, portraits with one final look at the queen. Painted less than a year before her death in 1603, even though, look closely, she's looking younger and more ravishing than she had in years. This is the rainbow portrait uh, by an unknown painter, but probably a Dutchman. And she here is the personification of fame. She is clothed in jewels in an orange robe. Let's go in for a detail on the robe. The robe actually has ears and eyes depicted on it. You can see them. She hears all, she sees all. That serpent on her sleeve is probably a real jewel of gold and opals and rubies. It's listed in a royal inventory of 1600, and it symbolizes knowledge. Therefore, she knows all. Over there on the left is the motto. It says, uh, now she's holding a rainbow in her hand. I know it looks gray, but at one point when it was first painted, it was a brilliantly colored bright rainbow. The Latin motto says, non sine sole iris which means no rainbow without the sun, meaning Elizabeth is the sun and she's the source of life. Now the painting was commissioned by Robert Cecil as part of an entertainment at his house party in the winter of 1602. Among the festivities was a presentation to the queen of letters from the emperor of China. Well, that was a fantasy. She knew they weren't real, but it was part of the entertainment. The orange robe was also supposed to be <clears throat> a gift from the emperor, but we know that it was Cecil who bought it for her. She is fame, the personification of fame, and her fame is spreading throughout the world, even to China. So these years of Elizabeth's reign really do constitute England's golden age. She reigned in peace, mostly overcoming religious and political conflicts. It was a prosperous age as England's ships went around the world in search of goods, adventure, colonization, profit. And orbiting around the queen was a court of the most accomplished people in the land. One author writes, their homes looked like the dwellings of men and women who had revived the ability to read Greek, who could speak Italian, who ordered expensive clothes from Paris, who wrote everything from prayers to shopping lists in Latin, and who yet were deeply and self-consciously rooted in their native England soil, loving the English landscape. Elizabeth was no doubt a complex figure. She's been described as constant, imperious, and imperial. She dominated all she surveyed through her cunning wit, loyalty, charm, bad temper, or of extreme wealth, and penny-pinching, parsimony. <laughs> there is uh, the emergence of a distinct Elizabethan style centered on the glorification of the queen herself, and I think we've certainly seen that in the look at these portraits today. Elizabeth knew that as queen, she was always on display. This speaks directly to the quote often attributed to the late Queen Elizabeth II, who passed away last September, who said, I have to be seen to be believed. With that, we'll stop. And if you have any comments or questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Thank you. So Mary, wonderful job as always. Uh, folks, uh, please uh, get your comments and questions in for Mary and uh, we'll go for another 10 minutes or so. Uh, Margaret says, thank you for the wealth of knowledge that you have imparted on us. <laughs> Holly says, wonderful presentation. She loved the pin money story. Yeah. She had never heard that before. No, I hadn't either. Yeah, Dawn says, this was fascinating and beautifully presented. Thank you. Jean says, this was fantastic. You are such a good presenter. Oh, you're very kind. Oh, let's get to some questions. Let's stop yeah. the flat. We'll pause the flattery yes. for now. Yes, uh, uh, like Elizabeth <laughs> might go on and on, but okay, let's have some yeah. questions, see if I can answer any of them. 
Uh, Karen asks, did Elizabeth's portrait with the red sleeves have pomegranate motifs because that was Anne Boleyn's? Uh, if yes, would that be upsetting to Henry VIII? You know, it all, it's interesting about the pomegranate motif because it also had been used by Catherine of Aragon. And, um, but it, I think, was just subsumed into a royal motif. Um, and so uh, I, I doubt that that particular thing would have upset Henry because we do see it, uh, it. But you're absolutely right to point out that he just vilified Anne Boleyn. He just felt, um, you know, and she was wife number two for keeping records. Uh, but interesting, good eye on the pomegranate. It really had been something that, that both the first two wives of Henry VIII had used, but it just sort of melded into royal motif. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, why are so many of the portraits done by, quote, unidentified artists, unquote? I would Good think question. artists painting royal royalty would want to sign them. Absolutely. Um, they didn't much sign their works, uh, or if they did, it was often not the way we think of, but it was in a written inscription on it. Um, one of the things that happens is, as I mentioned, that they, they're often copied over, they were often at the time copied over and over and over in workshops of, so Nicholas Hilliard would have a workshop, Hans Holbein had a workshop, um, a popular image of the queen, as I said, her face might be used again and again. And so um, some of that, some of the artist's name associated with it gets lost. Also, a couple of other things in play. Artists we think of as like, um, you know, rock stars, maybe, <laughs> whatever today, but they were just craftsmen. Uh, the, the jeweler would be important. The, 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 you know, the cloth, not so much the clothier, but say the, the court jeweler who made this beautiful brooch, for instance. So the artist was seen as a craftsman. They were not uh, elevated the way we might think of them today as uh, someone who's, who, um, and so uh, they weren't thought of as that. They didn't actually always sign their works because they were just doing something they were being hired to do. Um, and, uh, and also one more thing to add, uh, when her successor, we just talked about how she didn't have an heir, um, her successor was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, James I. And um, it, it, a lot of her portraits kind of went into hiding. People who had them kind of uh, uh, put them away um, because now you have James I on the throne and um, everybody's about glorifying his reign. So sometimes when something's put away for a long time, people forget who did it. So. My, my pal Carol asks, uh, do you know what those pins were made of? Oh, I think they're little pieces of, of iron. I think they're little pieces of iron. Uh, one of our international friends, uh, Harvey, asks, what is uh, the significance of the smaller loop on her pearl necklaces? The smaller loop on her pearl necklaces. Um, let me, can we go back some? I'm not sure what we're well, looking Well, actually, Mary, I think if you go forward to the, the one we were just on, um, Yep. Yeah, you, you can kind of see it there in that. Oh, I see. You mean that it's she's not wearing the necklaces down, but they're just looped up. Oh, uh, to fashion. Yeah, I know we saw that in one of the early ones as well. Yeah. Um, just a fashion, maybe easier to get more of them in, dis, you know, displayed that way. Um, they're often caught up in knots sometimes so that they're not hanging down so long. Uh, she had she is also wearing one, once you get past her waist. Um, this dress really poofs out. So rather than have it sit, the end of the necklace sit on an uncomfortable poofed out area, she draws it up. Uh, so you do see that in a very well spotted. You do see it in several, but I think it's just fashion. I think it had to do with the way the dresses were constructed and how long those ropes of pearls were. They were super long. Uh, Raina asks, what is the significance of the eye and ears embroidered on some of the clothing? Yeah, well, we are going to look at that one. They, there they are. Oh, my Lord. Um, it, it really is meant to say that she sees all and she hears all. She was omniscient. She knew everything. She saw everything. She was hearing everything. This portrait is just a uh, overblown glorification of Elizabeth as queen. And if you see 
even in uh, the lace, it looks very dainty, the lace around her neck, the lace ruff there and the collar. Um, it's starched to within an inch of its life because it's sticking up. But there's even a jewel um, attached to the lace. If you're looking at the portrait, the detail on the right, it's just to the left of her chin, if you will. And it looks like a little hand and it's a jeweled image of a hand and a sleeve or, or a glove. Um, they just, she just stuck jewels everywhere. They just stuck them everywhere. They could be, look at her headdress. It just goes on and on and on and on because it could. Uh, Dottie, my, my uh, old pal Dottie says, am I the only one who was surprised at the waistlines? Um, how skinny they were, how thick they were. Uh, she's laced into this dress. Uh, she is pinned into these dresses and um, so, uh, but by the time you're looking at this woman and um, she, I mean, she is almost 68 years old here. <laughs> so let's just say she's not really depicted as she actually looked, is she? Because <laughs> she doesn't look 68. So um, we're going to go a uh, speed round here, Mary, because we only have about five more minutes. Okay. Um, Jackie asks, is it true that as she was dying, she stood for something like three days and died standing up? She, uh, there are reports that she was afraid to lie down because she was afraid she would never get up again. Um, and uh, she may, uh, yes, so I, I don't know, you know, I mean, we will never know, but there are different people who were attending her said that she did like stand for 36 hours or three days or, uh, and that she was afraid. I don't know that she died standing up, but she, she, she certainly did seem, uh, the stories would indicate that she was afraid to lie down. Um, she had a very short illness. Some people suggest, um, most common is suggested um, um, a lead, you know, blood poisoning from the uh, lead makeup that she wore. And she wore that white makeup in part because it was fashionable but also because she had had smallpox as a young woman and right. it had left her face with scars that she wanted to hide. Yeah, and that actually answered another person's question. Yeah. Uh, Trish um, says, very interesting, thank you. Uh, I always associate the high collars with her. I was mm -hmm. surprised to see the lower neckline in the final rainbow portrait. Honey, let, let me tell you, some of those, low, some of her necklines were way lower than we would think would be <laughs> appropriate. Um, and strangely enough, that was part of her, uh, you know, that, that, yeah. In fact, we have, they have the reports of like um, foreign ambassadors coming to the country uh, to visit and pay homage to the queen and her court coming back and going, Oh my Lord, they saw everything, you know. Um, so yes, it's not something we tend to think of as uh, very royal, <laughs> but she she certainly uh, did have some pretty low cut dresses. Yep. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, why were artists from other countries painting these portraits? Why not those from her own country? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Well, Nicholas Hilliard was English, so good for him but it's actually a, an interesting and deep question and part of it has to do with the fact that a lot of these artists were refugees to England they were leaving um having been oppressed in uh, uh, Europe um by um uh, the Catholic Church, a lot of them were leaving and fleeing to a Protestant England while Elizabeth was queen. And so that led to an influx. Hans Holbein, though, um, the first one who we looked at with Henry VIII, he was actually a renowned artist uh, in his homeland. Um, but he was, uh, uh, and he has famous paintings of Erasmus. He has famous paintings of, of uh, Sir Thomas More and people like that. Uh, he, he just uh, was an immigrant. He, he was leaving oppression in Europe and coming to England for opportunity. But there were some English artists and Nicholas Hilliard certainly is one of the famous ones. All right, let's get back to the flattery here. <laughs> um, so Marion says, great presentation, well done. Roland says, delightfully detailed, gloriously illustrated. Okay. Darlene loved it. Frank says, bravo. Teresa loved it all. 
Ellen says, I cannot add one thing to the comments already posted. Aww. This was wonderful. The time flew by. Um, Jennifer says, uh, flattery aside, you explained a lot about my ancestor. Uh, Nina says, there you go, huh? Uh, yes. Nina says that speech uh, she gave to her soldiers, yeah. there was some question whether she actually spoke those famous words. Right. Um, and th there are, but at the t all I can say is that at the time, um, it was reported that she did, and it was printed, and um, a, a priest or minister had written it down. I mean, uh, there were sort of that one comes with some on-site suggestions that it really did happen. Uh, but as I say, we don't know, there was nobody there to paint a quick picture of it. So we don't have a beautiful portrait of her in armor. But um, yeah, well, you know, it could be propaganda. Sure, of course. It makes a good story uh, though. Yeah, we're, so we're starting to wind down, folks. Uh, Dory says, wonderful presentation. I totally enjoyed it. Uh, Lois says, a very enjoyable and interesting presentation. Julie says, thank you for a very engaging presentation. I now want to go to England and yes. see these portraits up close. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I don't blame you there. Uh, you'll want to aim for London for the natural, National Portrait Gallery, where a lot of them uh, are located. So, uh, but there actually, if you, if you also want to go to Cleveland, Ohio, uh, there is a beautiful Tudor show. Many of these portrait photos were taken in New York when it was in that stop. So look up Cleveland Museum of Art, my old homestead, and um, think about going there to the Tudor show. Karen says, thank you. One of my favorite subjects is the history of England and the monarchy. I loved this presentation. Thank you. Um, let's see, Carol, I don't want to end on that question. So we're going to blow past that. Uh, Susan says, uh, I thought she became quite... Uh, uh, corpulence later in life. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Uh, you would, uh, you would be. Yeah. yeah she was very uh, ill later in yeah, life. Um, right. She was that. Yeah. Uh, e, e uh, enjoyed the half that she saw, and she's going to watch the other half on the recording. Uh, Amy says thank you for a wonderful presentation. Kirk says thank you. Tina loved it. Joanne says thank you so much, Mary. Uh, I, uh, in, uh, Elizabeth I was also one of her relatives. Oh my and, gosh! Um, Joanne wants to know when will we see you for another presentation. And okay. Joanne, I can tell you that Mary will be back with us on Zoom four weeks from today, kind of. on Thursday, March sixteenth at ten thirty for uh, a, a talk on uh, Notre Dame. Notre Dame. So Really looking forward to that one, Mary. That, that'll Thank be you. a good that, one. That'll bring us up to date with, you know, uh, well, how it was built, but then um, obviously information about uh, the rebuilding. Yeah. The rebuilding that's going on now. Uh, Arising from the Ashes is the that's subtitle it. for that presentation. Okay. So <laughs> uh, I, th I think uh, there was a whole host of uh, questions we weren't able to cover, uh, and that just seems to happen. I'm sorry. It's actually a good sign that a lot of people are so engaged and they have lots of comments and questions, uh, but I do want to honor the one-hour commitment today. So Mary, any last words before we wrap it up? No, thank you so much, Robert and Tuxbury and friends and, and people from uh, everybody who's been watching. Thank you so much. And I'll see you in a month. Yeah, we had Ecuador, we had England, we had Montreal. <laughs> so we were all over the place today. So thank wow. you, everyone. Those watching live, look for the email later today with the feedback survey, the recording and information about all the other upcoming virtual programs uh, for, for, art, for art history, uh, including the Notre Dame one that I referenced just now. So thank you all and everyone have a great rest of the day. Thanks, bye -bye. Mary. Thank bye. you, bye-bye.